Hey everyone, and welcome to a brand new video. Tonight, we have two hours worth of horror stories. I hope you all enjoy them. If you do, please be sure to drop a like rating. Subscribing if you are new is also very much appreciated. I post videos just like this every Sunday night. Anyways, sit back, do whatever it is that you do to relax and enjoy the video. And as always, I hope you all have a great night. Even thinking about retelling the story has made me the most afraid I've ever been in my life. I suppose if I keep it bottled up, I'll go insane. God knows the security company isn't talking. I feel like if I don't warn people and they go there, all right, right? If I'm telling the story, then I'd better back up a bit. It started a little over a month ago. I work for a security firm that guards projects all over the country. I'm sort of a specialist. It seems like if there's some weird stuff happening out of sight, I get called in. I'm not sure why. Maybe my ex-military background. Or maybe the fact that, well, we'll get to that. This place up in New England was having some trouble. A local firm was remodeling an old church when workers suddenly started quitting. No one seemed to have a good reason why they didn't want to work there anymore. So guess who got the call to come in and straighten things out? Driving up there gave me the most profound feeling of being alone I've ever had. And mind you, I've sat watching caves, foxholes, ditches, some of the most godforsaken places on the planet, all by my lonesome. And never did I feel as soul-crushingly alone as driving up that little two-lane road that was the only sign of humanity as the trees seemed to close in on me from every side. As unnerving as that was, it was nothing compared to pulling into the little town where the church was. It was like the nightmare scene from a B-horror movie, I guess. Arriving at night in the middle of a rainstorm didn't help. I pulled in beside the only vehicle I saw and ran inside the hotel that looked like a saloon out of an old western. I barely got the door closed until there was a light and a gun shoved in my face. Who the hell are you? Said a man from somewhere behind the glare of a flashlight. Jones, I said, slowly raising my hands. I was called in to help out with your worker problem. The light lowered, but the gun stayed. What company do you work for? Sentinel Security, I said. I saw the man relax a little, but mostly I was happy that he lowered his gun. In the best of times, a gun in a situation is less than ideal. All kinds of accidents can happen. I've seen many innocent bystanders fall victim to contagious gunfire. The man stepped over to a table and sat as I looked around the room. I was surprised at how much it looked like a movie set from an old western, right down to the lit lanterns on the tables and hanging from the rafters. He beckoned me over and I sat across from him. Judging by the welcome, I'm guessing the workers aren't the only ones who are spooked, I said. He looked at the gun, then laid it on the table. He seemed to be in his forties or fifties, but there was a tiredness in his eyes. He looked weary and haggard. Truth be told, I'm not even sure a gun would do any good. Maybe you should tell me when the trouble started, he said, looking at me with worry tugging at his eyes. Your contract's open, right? I nodded which means you have to finish the job, or you don't get paid, right? I nodded again. He looked me over for a long moment, then sat back, drained his glass of amber-colored liquid, and sighed. I bought this town a while back, he started, recently with the passing of my wife, and I decided I needed to throw myself into a project to keep me busy. I wanted to revitalize this town and turn it into a tourist attraction. I'm sorry for your loss. He nodded in recognition, but never said another word about her. Things were going along smoothly, he said. 
the buildings you see have all been restored. They look good. You should have seen them when we started, he scoffed. They were falling apart. No one had lived here for years. That's why I was able to buy the whole place for next to nothing. I'm thinking that's not the only reason, I said. Yes, he said, as a haunted look passed through his eyes. We saved the church for last because it needed the most work. But once they started remodeling is when things began to happen. Things? I asked. It wasn't much at first. Shovels and saws would go missing. Tools would be left in fine order at night, only to be in complete disarray in the morning. For a while, the workers blamed each other, saying there was a prankster among them, but that wasn't the case. Oh, how I wish it was, he said, his voice trailing off. I waited for a long moment for him to continue. We found the first body shortly after that, he said so quietly, I barely heard him. Of a worker? I asked. He nodded. Dead, he nodded again. Why didn't you stop everything and leave? I asked. Because it was already too late, he said. We had disturbed it. Disturbed what? I pressed. He opened his mouth as if to speak, but no words came out. He shook his head and looked away. For a moment, I could swear I saw a tear run down his cheek. I'm sorry, he said, rubbing his palms on his face. Let me take you to your room, and we'll discuss this further in the morning. My curiosity wanted him to finish the story, but it seemed like his weariness had been amplified by alcohol. I followed him as he carried the lantern up the stairs to the first door and opened it for me. He handed me the light and told me the bathroom was across the hall if I needed it. I'll be here bright and early in the morning to give you the tour, he said, sounding more like a host. Aren't you staying here tonight? I asked. His eyes flashed genuine fear. Not here, he said. I'll be back in the morning around the comfortable looking room, trying to decide what was so wrong with it as he stepped to the door. Oh, by the way, he said, stopping at the doorway. Don't bother with your cell phone. There's no signal up here. I glanced down at my phone, and when I looked up, he was gone. I picked up the lantern and stepped to the doorway, but I didn't hear him leaving. You would have thought someone walking out on a hardwood floor would make some noise, but it was silent. The only noise I heard was the rain pelting against the windows. Since I was already in the hallway, I decided to check out the bathroom. I walked a short distance down the hall and found it to be functional and clean, but nothing extraordinary. While I was there, I used the toilet and washed my hands then went back to my room to get my toiletries kit to brush my teeth. Carrying a lantern around was a little disconcerting. I've had to deal without electricity many times before, but that wasn't what was bothering me. The shadows from the lamp danced all over, giving the impression of others in the room with me. It's strange because I've never had that feeling before. Shadows were always just shadows. I was trained to be cautious of who could be hiding in the shadows, not the shadows themselves. I finished up my bedtime routine and settled into sleep. There wasn't much of anything else to do, so might as well get some rest. One of the things I was taught early on in my career was that any time you get a chance to rest, you never know when the next chance will come. I laid down on the comfortable bed and did some relaxation exercises. Before I knew it, I was asleep. I woke with a start, not knowing why it was pitch black in the room. Instead of panicking, I touched my watch to illuminate it and found my phone. Turning on the flashlight, 
and lighting the... The lamp helped me to get my bearings, but still didn't tell me why I was awake. I sat there for a long moment, then I heard it. There was a loud clanking sound coming from somewhere outside. Sleeping in my clothes when on a job was a habit I'd gotten into when I first started doing private security. Another carryover from the military. I slipped out of bed and into my boots, then strapped on my utility belt and checked to make sure my sidearm was loaded. I turned off the phone's flashlight and grabbed a small utility flashlight from one of the pouches on the belt. For the moment, I holstered the gun and explored with the flashlight. This could be nothing. I didn't want to go in guns blazing just to find some kids playing around or a worker coming in early. I double-checked my watch. It was five o'clock in the morning. Seemed like an odd time for a worker to come in, but stranger things have happened. Working my way down the stairs quietly, I double-checked the bar room. It was empty. Opening the door, I had the strangest feeling that something was wrong. Nothing seemed to be out of place. It had stopped raining, and I stepped out onto the street to find a light layer of fog. Looking up and down the street, I heard the noise again. It sounded like it was coming from the direction of the church. Leading with the flashlight, I started in that direction. There seemed to be a slight orange glow coming from inside the building. The closer I got, the beam of my flashlight made the air around me glow. It made me feel like I was giving my position away. I fought back the feeling. This was a little town in Vermont, not an active war zone. I had to be cautious but also temperate with non-lethal actions. The church loomed in front of me. It seemed much larger up close. I climbed the steps and reached for the doorknob when a loud crack sounded behind me. I whipped around, shining my flashlight at everything, but there was nothing there. As I was looking back, I noticed the light in the window of my room. I must have left the lantern lit. As I looked, I saw the light dim for an instant, and then get brighter, almost as if someone had walked in front of it. The temperature felt like it was in the lower 70s, but that didn't keep a chill from running down my spine. Someone was curious to know who I was. From years of experience, I found that it's never good if someone wants to find out who you are, but doesn't want to do it face to face. That would be something to deal with when I got back to my room. For now, there was a church to explore. I got the feeling that someone was trying to distract me from entering the church. I reached the top of the stairs and turned the knob, but nothing happened. It didn't feel like it was locked. It was almost as if someone was on the other side holding the knob. I turned as hard as I could, and it finally gave, and the door opened dragging me inside and nearly knocking me to the floor. Regaining my balance, my hand hovered over my gun. Expecting to see someone doing something they weren't supposed to, as I slowly panned around the room, I found something much worse. Absolutely nothing. There was a lit lantern set up on a table near the altar that was in the middle of being restored. Other than that, there were a lot of pews that were halfway constructed. The ones that were finished looked like they had been sanded and were waiting for a layer of stain. I walked down the center aisle as if looking for a seat at a wedding or a funeral. As I approached the partially reconstructed pulpit, I looked up and saw a life-size wooden carving of Jesus on the cross. It looked old, not like wine that age as well but like decrepit. It had been painted fresh colors at one time, but now it was cracked and peeling away from the carving. It looked grotesque to see the layers of skin peeling away like it was rotting off his body. I'm not the most religious man, but I believe in Jesus. I've prayed enough prayers sitting in foxholes and caves, asking to be rescued from bad situations, and I'm still here. 
I wouldn't call him, and I best buds. I know our relationship could be closer, but seeing him that way, rotting to pieces, was just disturbing. As I looked into his face, I swore I saw his eyes open for an instant. I blinked my own eyes to be sure I was seeing right, but when I looked again, they were closed. It was my imagination playing tricks on me. At least, that's what I told myself as I stepped onto the platform and looked around. Off to each side were doors. I went to the one to the right and found a small broom closet. The one on the left held a set of stairs that went down and disappeared into darkness. Just inside the door, there was yellow and black caution tape blocking the way down. I shone the light on the stairs, and they looked sturdy enough. I reached for the tape, but before I got a hold of it, a strong hand grabbed my shoulder and turned me around. What do you think you're doing? said a man who was a full foot shorter than me, but his grip felt like iron. I was about to go down those stairs, I said. Son, he looked at me with the incredulous look a parent gave a toddler who was reaching for a hot stove. And you didn't see the caution tape, he said. I saw it, I replied. Who are you anyway? I've never seen you before, he asked. Jones, I said, offering my hand. I'm with Sentinel Security. I was called to investigate why workers keep quitting. He looked at my hand, then at me. So this investigation includes ignoring obvious warnings. My hand was still extended, but had yet to be shaken. I let it fall back to my side. Are you a worker or a foreman? He scoffed. Nothing so formal. I make sure people do what needs to be done. So, foreman. His eyes bled with suspicion as he stared at me. Where did you say you were from again? As I was about to answer, more workers entered, followed by the owner I'd met last night. Let's ask the boss if he knows you, the foreman said smugly. The owner locked eyes with me and gave me the strangest look as he walked up to us. Good morning, he said, addressing both of us. Good morning, sir, the foreman said. I caught this man snooping around in here. Did you know, he said. Is that true? The owner interrupted. I wasn't snooping, I was investigating, I said. Do you remember our conversation last night? His eyes opened a hair wider for an instant, then went back to normal. Of course I do, he said, with a smile that seemed forced. Remind me again, my memory isn't the best, he said. We met in the saloon, talked for a little bit, and then you showed me to my room, indeed, he said, with a raised eyebrow. Did I say anything else? You told me you bought this place after your wife passed away, and problems started after you found the first dead worker, I said with alarm. Dead, the foreman said with alarm. When did this happen? The owner burst into laughter. It appears Mr. Jones here has pulled a fast one on you, he said to the foreman. Perhaps he and I should go and discuss the matter in private, and you can continue with your work. The owner grabbed my arm and guided me away from the foreman, whose eyes burned as they followed us out the door. We walked out of the church in silence as he nodded to workers who were straggling in to start for the day. He led me back to the saloon, and we sat at the same table as before. So, you and I met in this saloon last night, he said, at this very table, he said. Hi, he said. I came to the door, and you pulled a gun on me. His eyebrows raised. Did I? No, and what time was this, he asked. I'd say around nine o'clock. We sat here and talked about what was going on.
going on with the workers, I said. And what else did I say other than about the worker? He asked. I asked why you hadn't left, and you said it was too late, I said. This time, he didn't try to hide it. His eyes grew wide, and he stared at me for a long moment, then seemed to gather himself. I apologize, Mr. Jones, if this all seems a little strange, he said. You and I did not have a conversation last night. It was my turn to raise my eyebrows. At nine o'clock last night, I was in bed with my very much alive wife, he said. But you said, and we have not had any workers die, he interrupted. I don't understand. Neither do I, I said, thinking about it for a long moment. You were drinking when you talked to me. Is it possible you were too drunk to remember? He leaned a little closer. I haven't had a drink in 19 years, he said, reaching into his pocket and setting a coin on the table. I picked it up and looked at it. It was an AA coin. Then who did I talk to last night, I asked. He put the coin back in his pocket. Are you sure it was me who was drinking? He asked, looking up at me with suspicion in his eyes. I don't drink, I said, meeting his gaze. He leaned back in his chair. It seems we've reached an impasse, he said. Perhaps I should call your company and have a different person come and investigate the matter. I wanted to find out what was going on, I said. Perhaps you should give me at least a day to investigate, my son. Unless there's some other reason you don't want me to get to the bottom of this, I said, smiling. But it wasn't friendly. Please continue your investigation, Mr. Jones, he said, unimpeded. I will inform the foreman to allow you free reign. Thank you, I said standing to leave, just collapsed to the ground, his form twisting and contorting before dissolving into a black, oily substance that seeped into the earth. The room fell into an eerie silence, broken only by the sound of my racing heartbeat. I stood there for a moment, trying to process what had just happened. The weight of the situation began to settle on my shoulders, but I pushed it aside. There was still work to be done. I turned and quickly made my way back through the tunnel, my senses on high alert. As I emerged from the church, I found the foreman waiting for me, his expression a mixture of concern and disbelief. What happened in there? He asked, his voice trembling slightly breath, trying to steady myself. It's taken care of, I replied, my tone leaving no room for further questions. But we need to get everyone out of here. Now. The foreman nodded, sensing the urgency in my voice. Together, we hurried back to the town, rallying the workers and instructing them to pack up their belongings. As we made our way out, shake the feeling of unease that lingered in the air. Once we were safely away from the church, I called the authorities and informed them of what had transpired. I knew they would need to conduct a thorough investigation, but for now, the immediate danger had passed. As I watched the workers board the bus that would take them to safety, I couldn't help but feel a sense of relief wash over me. Despite the horrors I had witnessed, we had managed to avert a disaster. But as I looked back at the looming silhouette of the church against the night sky, I knew that this was far from over. There were still mysteries lurking in the shadows, waiting to be uncovered. And as long as there were secrets to be revealed, I would be there to uncover them. But for now, it was time to leave this place behind and move on to the next chapter of my journey. As I climbed into my car and drove away, I couldn't 
help but wonder what other horrors awaited me in the darkness. Only time from an unknown number. The message read, Hey there, it's Jessica from Tinder. My heart skipped a beat. I hadn't expected her to reach out so soon. I quickly replied, Hey Jessica, how's your day going? She responded almost immediately, and we fell into a casual conversation about our interests, hobbies, and plans for the day. Throughout the day, I found myself eagerly anticipating her messages, and we continued to chat on and off between my work assignments. As the evening approached, she mentioned that she was new to the area and looking for someone to show her around. Without hesitation, I offered to take her out for dinner that evening. We agreed to meet at a local restaurant, and as I waited nervously at the table, I couldn't help but feel a sense of excitement mixed with apprehension. What if she wasn't who she claimed to be? What if this was all just a prank or worse, a trap? But as soon as she walked through the door, any doubts I had vanished. Jessica was even more beautiful in person. With a warm smile and a friendly demeanor that immediately put me at ease, we spent the evening chatting and laughing over dinner. And as the night wore on, it felt like we had known each other for much longer than just a day. After dinner, we took a stroll through the city streets, lost in conversation and enjoying each other's company. Eventually, we found ourselves standing in front of a small park, bathed in the soft glow of the streetlights above. It was then that Jessica turned to me with a shy smile and asked if she could see me again. I couldn't hide my own smile as I nodded eagerly, feeling a surge of happiness that I hadn't felt in a long time. And as we parted ways that night, I knew that I had found something special in Jessica, something worth holding on to. In the days and weeks that followed, Jessica and I continued to spend time together, getting to know each other better with each passing day. She brought joy and excitement into my life in a way that I hadn't thought possible. And I found myself falling for her more deeply each moment we shared. But amidst the happiness and newfound love, there was always a lingering sense of unease, a feeling that something wasn't quite right. I couldn't shake the feeling that there was more to Jessica than met the eye, that there were secrets hidden beneath her charming exterior. Yet, despite my doubts and suspicions, I chose to ignore them to bury them deep down and focus on the happiness that Jessica brought into my life. After all, everyone has their secrets, right? And as long as Jessica was by my side, I felt like I could handle whatever came our way. Little did I know, the truth would soon come crashing down around me, shattering the illusion of happiness and forever changing the course of my life. That's a story for another time. A tale of love, betrayal, and the darkness that lies within us all. Normal. After that, my dad got back from his business trip. I didn't really have much to tell him. We went back to our normal routine a few more days had gone by, and the Ellsworths still hadn't returned. I thought this was odd, considering they had been gone for over a week. At this point, I asked my dad if we could go check on them, but he brushed it off and said they were probably just enjoying their vacation. I agreed, but I couldn't shake the feeling that something wasn't right. It was a warm summer, evening. I was sitting in my room playing video games when I heard a knock on the door. I got up and went downstairs, expecting to see my dad. When I opened the door, I was met with two police officers standing on our porch. They asked if they could come in and speak with me. I was confused, but I let them in. They said
sat down at the kitchen table and asked me if I knew anything about the Ellsworth family. I told them about the conversation, my dad, and I had about them being on vacation. But the officers looked concerned, they explained to me, that the Ellsworths had been reported missing by their neighbors, and they were trying to gather any information they could. I felt a sinking feeling in my stomach as they asked me more questions about the family I told them everything I knew about them, and even mentioned the strange footsteps I had heard coming from their house a few nights earlier. The officers thanked me for my cooperation and told me to let them know if I remembered anything else before. They left. I was worried about the Ellsworths and hoped they would be found safe and sound. The next day, my dad and I went over to the Ellsworths' house to see if we could find any clues about what had happened to them. When we got there, we noticed that their cars were still parked in the driveway and there were no signs of forced entry. We knocked on the door, but there was no answer. So we decided to take a look around the property. As we were searching the backyard, I noticed something strange near the edge of the woods. It looked like a pile of dirt that had been recently disturbed. I pointed it out to my dad and we both walked over to investigate. As we got closer, we realized that it was a freshly dug hole. My dad called the police right away, and they came to investigate. They dug up the hole and found something horrifying buried underneath it. It was the bodies of the Ellsworth family. They had been brutally murdered and buried in their own backyard. I couldn't believe what I was seeing, I felt, sick to my stomach, knowing that something so terrible had happened right next door to us. The police launched an investigation into the murders, but they were never able to find out who was responsible for them to this day. The case remains unsolved, and the killer is still out there somewhere. It was a traumatic experience that I'll never forget and it made me realize that you never truly know what's going on behind closed doors, the woods trapped in a cabin surrounded by monsters and hallucinations. I didn't want to die like this. I fought to stay awake. Even though every part of my being screamed for rest, I needed to survive. I needed to find a way out. Suddenly, a noise broke through the haze of my mind. Footsteps, heavy footsteps coming towards the cabin. My heart raced. Was it the monsters had? They finally found a way in. I struggled to sit up, but my body felt like lead. The footsteps grew louder and louder until they were right outside the door. I held my breath, waiting for whatever was on the other side to reveal itself. Then the door burst open, and I saw them, the police, they had come to rescue me. I felt a surge of relief wash over me as they rushed into the cabin, checking every corner, making sure it was safe. I tried to speak, but my voice was barely a whisper. They quickly realized how sick I was and called for medical assistance. Soon I was being loaded into an ambulance taken to the hospital where I could receive proper care. I drifted in and out of consciousness during the journey, my mind still foggy from fever and illness. But I was safe. I was going to be okay as I lay in the hospital bed recovering. I couldn't help but wonder what had happened in those woods. Who were those monsters? And why were they after me? may never know the answers to those questions. But one thing was for certain, I was alive, and I was going to make sure I stayed that way, no matter what it took. Nowhere did I even like cabins, so why did I come here? I could have read all those books at home. Another banging noise woke me. This time, it was different. I also smelled smoke, but 
I didn't remember the last time I got up to add to the fire. A burst of energy came to my body as I stood up, trying to understand what was happening. To my horror, I saw smoke pouring through the shutters. I quickly realized the cabin was on fire. The flames hadn't reached inside yet. But if I didn't get out soon, I would die from the smoke. I coughed, the air quickly becoming dense. I started to make my way to the front door, but then my body stopped. For some reason, I couldn't control my actions. A groaning sound came from the walls. It almost sounded like a scream. Tears stung my eyes as I was forced to watch my body move away from freedom. I ended up in the kitchen. Someone else was there. It was hard to see her full features because of the thick air. She was coughing as well. Come on, you'll die in here, she shouted. The back door had been busted open. She held a large hammer in her hand, showing how she'd gotten in. I took a few steps closer, but my hand moved on its own. In one swift motion, I grabbed a knife off the counter and attacked her with it. She backed up, but still sliced a deep cut across her left eye. I wanted to stop. I didn't want to hurt her. Blood flowed from her wound onto the floor. For some reason, the wood absorbed the liquid, leaving no traces. Sorry about that, I said. Yes, she said and raised the hammer. The last thing I remember inside that cabin was a shock of pain against my temple. I woke up again, cold and throat raw. My body refused to stop shaking, but the fever was gone. I was very weak for some odd reason. I sat in my car. The cabin in front was fully engulfed in flames. A screaming sound came from the building, and I could have sworn I saw a burst of dark smoke come from the flames, flying off deep into the woods. I called the police. Just hold on till then. I looked over to see the redhead taking off her jacket to wrap it around my shaking body. I tried to speak, but my throat was too dry. She helped me get a sip of water from a bottle she brought along. Her left eye closed from the wound I had given her. I'm sorry, I croaked. Don't worry about it. My eye is fine, and I'll have a neat scar, she replied with a smile. The cabin. I started, then coughed. Yeah, it was draining your life force and stuff like that. I'm glad I got you out in time. You'll recover in a few weeks anyway. I got to go later, Gator. I couldn't stop her. I wanted to thank her or find out her name, but she left, not wanting to stick around for when the police showed up. I was admitted to the hospital. When I was able, there was a round of questioning. I didn't have a lot of answers. There was a shell of a burned down cabin, but there hadn't been any registered in the area. The road that led to the cabin disappeared before the police showed up. It was a miracle they got through the woods to find me. I said I had rented the cabin through an online ad, but there hadn't been any charge on my credit card and I couldn't find the ad again, I explained. They were puzzled, but lacked any clues to go forward. I've heard whispers that people had started to disappear inside those woods a few years ago. Two bodies had been found inside the shell of a house that should not have been in the forest. They had been within walking distance of a town. No one understood why they let themselves starve to death inside an abandoned home. I needed a few weeks off work to recover. At least my boss was good about it. I was thankful I had lived through the worst vacation anyone could ever take, but not having answers bothered me. I really wanted to thank that strange girl who saved me. I wanted to tell my story, mostly to warn others. There was something unnatural lurking off in the forest. There are some dark things in this world, and there are some decent people too. Let's hope you never come across darkness 
without some light appearing to guide your way out. I looked down at the creaky basement stairs, trailing off into a void of darkness. I tried to swallow, but my throat wouldn't let me. My grandmom's house was mostly a pleasant place to me. All except the basement, that is. The basement was old and smelled of mildew and dust. The stairs leading down were the wooden ones that had gaps behind each stair, which only amplified the feeling that when you walked down, something would grab you from underneath. There were three singular lights down there that had to be turned on with pull cords, so you had to go down into the near complete darkness to turn them on. I stood at the top of the stairs, my childhood imagination running wild with thoughts of monsters in the darkness. I knew I had to go down. Both my grandparents were disabled, so it had to be me to bring up the things from the freezer my grandmom needed. I knew the very real risk of one of them injuring themselves down there greatly outweighed my fear of things that lurk in the dark. I took a deep, shaky breath and ran down the stairs as fast as I could and sprinted towards the first light. Click! The dim light buzzed softly with electricity as it came to life. It only illuminated about a four-feet circle around me. I looked around at the old workbench and all the random stuff that was down there, which did nothing but creep me out even more. There were so many dark corners for things to lurk, and the dim ring of light around me only made the rest of the darkness seem more oppressive. As I was preparing myself to run to the next light near the old fridge, suddenly I was plunged into darkness. I didn't hear a click or that distinct popping noise of a bulb dying. It was just silent. Waves of fear washed over me as my mind raced. I had to do something. I ran towards the next light, feeling invisible hands reaching for me as I moved. Click. Nothing. The lights weren't working. I pulled the chain again, keeping my eyes shut tight just praying that when I pulled it again, I'd see a flash of light through my eyelids. But I didn't. It was dark. The only light in the basement was the subtle glow of the streetlights coming through the tiny basement windows. I told myself on repeat, there was nothing there, and monsters weren't real. Trying to find any shred of bravery left in me, I took a deep breath as I flung the door of the freezer open and grabbed the things my grandmom had asked me to bring up. I started turning to run back to the stairs when I heard the worst noise I could have imagined at that moment. The basement door slammed shut loudly and forcefully. Whack! No, 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 please, no. I scrambled up the stairs as fast as my body would carry me tried desperately to open the door. It wouldn't budge. The door didn't have a lock on it, but it did stick in the frame sometimes. It was hard for even a grown adult to open, let alone a young girl. My grandparents never closed it for exactly that reason. Grandmom! Grandpa! Someone, please, please, open the door. I dropped everything I was holding and violently shook the door handle as hard as I could. I yanked and pulled on it desperately, but it didn't move. The door opened in towards the basement, so ramming myself into it wasn't an option. But truthfully, I wasn't strong enough to unstick the door, let alone bash my way through it. Then a horrible thought crept into my mind. The door faced inward, there was no draft at all, let alone one strong enough to have done that. Someone had to have slammed it like that from inside the basement. Then, I remembered just to the left of the fridge was the cellar door that led to the outside. But I'd have to go all the way across the basement to get there. I sat for a moment with 
my head against the door, and my back scrunched tightly against the wall, trying to figure out what to do when I heard a noise from below. It was just a quiet little scuffle, like someone dragging something across the concrete floor, but it sounded like it was directly below me. I froze as I listened, and then there it was again. It sounded like it was moving from under the stairs towards the bottom step. I was shaking so violently. If someone had seen me, they probably would have thought I was having a seizure. Maybe I was. I don't really know. Grandmom! Grandpa, please, please open the door. I slammed my fists as hard as I could against the door. From below me, I heard the same sound growing closer. Please! I slammed my fist so hard, I had long, colorful bruises on them for over a week after. I'm truthfully amazed I didn't break any bones in my hands. As I heard the noise again, I turned my head towards the bottom of. Grandparents rush into the house, their worried expressions quickly turning to relief as they saw me. Are you okay? My grandpa asked, his voice filled with concern. I nodded, unable to find my voice just yet. My grandmom rushed over and wrapped me in a tight hug, comforting me with her presence. What happened, honey? What's going on? She asked, her eyes searching mine for answers. I took a deep breath, trying to steady myself before recounting the terrifying ordeal I had just experienced in the basement. My grandparents listened intently, their faces growing more serious with each detail I shared. We need to call someone, my grandpa said firmly, already reaching for the phone. As he made the call, my grandmom stayed by my side, offering words of comfort and reassurance. I felt a wave of gratitude wash over me, knowing that I wasn't alone in this. After speaking with the authorities, my grandpa returned, his expression grim. They're sending someone over to check it out, he said. In the meantime, let's get you cleaned up and comfortable. I nodded, feeling a sense of relief knowing that help was on the way. Together, we made our way to the bathroom, where I washed away the dirt and grime of the basement floor. As I scrubbed my hands, I couldn't shake the feeling of unease that lingered in the air. The memory of that twisted creature in the basement haunted me, filling me with a sense of dread. But for now, I pushed those thoughts aside, focusing on the warmth and safety of my grandparents' home. Whatever lurked in the darkness, I knew that as long as I had my family by my side, I could face it with courage and determination. Rules seemed pretty standard, like no tardiness, no personal calls during work hours, and dress code regulations. But then I stumbled upon a section titled Special Protocols, and things took a bizarre turn. It outlined some rules that seemed more suited to a dystopian novel than a corporate handbook. There were rules about never mentioning certain words, like red or orange, and always referring to co-workers by their last names only. There were also strict guidelines for reporting any unusual behavior or sightings in the workplace, with dire consequences for failing to comply. I couldn't shake the feeling of unease that crept over me as I read through the pages. What kind of company was this? And why were there such strange rules in place? I decided to put aside my concerns for the moment and focus on the task at hand. I glanced over at Mr. Hatch, who was engrossed in conversation with another employee. He seemed friendly enough, but there was something about him that set me on edge. I turned my attention back to the computer and began familiarizing myself with the company's software and systems. As I worked, 
I couldn't shake the feeling that something wasn't right about this place. But for now, I pushed aside my doubts and focused on doing my job to the best of my ability. After all, I needed this job to pay the bills, and I couldn't afford to let anything get in the way of that. For a year, that's when it hit me. This company was not just strange, it was downright sinister. The rules weren't just about maintaining a productive workplace. They were about control and fear, and the consequences for breaking them were far more severe than I could have imagined. As I sat at my desk, my mind raced with questions. What kind of place was this? And how had I ended up working here? I knew I needed to get out, but I also knew it wouldn't be easy. With rules like no quitting, and no whistleblowing. The company had effectively trapped its employees in a web of fear and manipulation. But I refused to be a pawn in their twisted game any longer. I needed to find a way to escape, to break free from this nightmare of a job. As I carefully plotted my next move, I couldn't help but feel a sense of determination rising within me. No matter what it took, I was going to find a way out of this hellish place and expose the truth about what was really going on behind closed doors. But for now, I had to bide my time, playing by their rules while secretly working towards my freedom. And with each passing day, my resolve only grew stronger. One way or another, I was going to break free from the clutches of this twisted company and reclaim my life blind spot. I felt the impact before I heard it. Metal crunching glass shattering, and then darkness. I woke up in the hospital, my head throbbing and my body aching all over the doctors told me I was lucky to be alive, that I had a concussion and some broken ribs, but nothing too serious. They kept me for observation overnight, and I was discharged the next day. But as I lay in bed recovering, I couldn't shake the feeling of unease that lingered in the back of my mind. It wasn't just the accident that bothered me. It was the timing. The intersection of 1st and 28th Street on the 128th day of the year. It felt like more than just a coincidence. It felt like a pattern, a pattern that I couldn't ignore as I lay in bed. I started to research. I scoured the internet for any information on accidents at that intersection on that day, but I found nothing. It was as if the accident never happened, but I knew it did. I remembered the sound of metal crunching and the sensation of glass shattering. I remembered the pain and the fear that had gripped me in those moments. But if there was no record of the accident, and what had happened to me. I couldn't shake the feeling that something was wrong, that there was more to this than met the eye. But try as I might, I couldn't find any answers. I was left with more questions than when I started, and a growing sense of dread that I couldn't shake. But I refused to let fear consume me. I refused to be paralyzed by the unknown. Instead, I made a decision to uncover the truth, no matter what it took, no matter where it led me. I was determined to find out what happened to me at that intersection on that fateful day, and why it seemed like the world was trying to erase it from existence the matter. So what you're saying is that if I change my perception, I can change my reality exactly if you stop fixating on these numbers. If you stop looking for patterns, you'll stop experiencing them. But what about the accidents? The mistakes, the bad luck, they're real enough, aren't they? Yes, but they're also a part of life. Accidents happen. Mistakes are made, bad luck strikes. But when you attribute them to some larger pattern, some cosmic conspiracy, you give them power over you become a victim of your own perception. 
Instead of taking control of your reality, you let it control you. But what about dad's room number? What about the accident? It's all a coincidence. It's all in your mind. You're giving meaning to random events because you want to believe there's some greater purpose, some hidden meaning behind it all. But the truth is, there is no hidden meaning. There is no grand design. There's just life messy, unpredictable, and sometimes unfair. But it's also beautiful and full of possibilities if you choose to see them. So what do you say? Are you ready to let go of this obsession with numbers and take control of your life again? I took a deep breath and let his words sink in. He was right. I had been letting these numbers control me, dictate my actions, and determine my fate. But no more from now on, I would live my life on my own terms. I would embrace the chaos and uncertainty and find beauty in the randomness of it all, because that's what life is all about, isn't it? Not knowing what's around the corner, but facing it head on with courage and determination. I thanked my brother for his wise words and hung up the phone with a newfound sense of clarity and purpose. I was ready to face whatever the universe had in store for me, and this time I would do it on my own terms. Reality has to originate inside your head, or so I suggested. You've just made it easier for it to find me. As I stared at my phone, a pop-up alerted me that the 49 ERs had won by a landslide score of 1 to 28. My weather app notified me that it was raining again, coming up on 1.28 inches of rain. I had a missed robocall from 1285553647. I was still staring at the screen when lightning split the sky into a freak accident. That's what the news outlets called it. Fox did an article about it. You might still be able to find it floating around the internet somewhere. They called me the girl who lived through lightning, but that's not really true. The lightning didn't hit me. It hit the roof, cracking the house open like an egg spilling singed shingles all over the front lawn. I knew I couldn't stop coincidence. I couldn't avoid the manifestation of this thing, this entity, any more than I could stop the march of time, but I could try. My brother was right. If I didn't know when the door was open, it couldn't come in to greet me. I destroyed all the clocks in the house, defaced too many books to count, and burnt the offending pages. Then, I booked a last-minute flight to somewhere I was unlikely to find a clock or license plate. There are precious few of those places left. I should probably explain why I'm writing this at this moment. I'm sitting on the plane as it descends through the dense black clouds. Thank God for in-flight Wi-Fi, or what could very well be my last words would be lost. I'm scared. I feel the vice enclosing me, an incredible pressure building. We're finally breaking our holding pattern. Well, it's circled in the sky, waiting for the storm to clear. A flight that was supposed to touch down well before midnight on the 27th of January altered its arrival date to the 28th of January. We're approaching 12,800 feet and I can't stop staring at the little screen in front of me, announcing the latest update to our flight details. Our estimated landing time is 1.28. Wish me luck, please. <laughs>